Hi everyone. Oh my gosh, Shahad, that was really nice and quick. Gosh, <laughs> I have to sit here like a little awkwardly for a couple of seconds, but wow, that was mega fast. How are you, Shahad? Good, good. I think, um, yeah, my good, right, yeah. You're okay. Yeah, awesome. oh, I, lo I love your room. Thank I'm you. you. With your book around you. So Nothing like, around me this time, no. It's very cozy and empty. Yeah, it's like, oh, Shahan has teleported somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. It's so lovely yeah. to have you join us at last. I feel like we've been the couple for so long. Glad we're here now. Yeah. I have been enjoying your beautiful book of that's there for everyone to see. Um, and it's good from the front. I love the front cover. It's those front covers that we're all so excited about. Uh, it's still, yeah, it still gets me every time. <laughs> it's still beautiful. It really captures so much, doesn't it? And uh, it's a beautiful way to um, entice people into the book, which is even more beautiful, dare I say. <laughs> Absolutely stunning work. So evocative, profound, so insightful, so instructive, um, so, tender, so tender. That's the thing that sort of, I feel, I mean, everybody will have their own. But for me, the thing that really stood out was the tenderness of the narrative and the gentleness. Uh, some really quite challenging ideas as well. Um, but before we dive into that, um, I'm going to introduce you to everybody who's joining us um, and also recommend that encourage everyone that if you have questions, comments as we go along, you can put comments underneath. And, you're on your phones, you'll see a little question mark screen and you can pop your questions into there as well. Um, I'm just going to say a special hello to Asia. Yeah, so Asia I see her there. <laughs> champion of the book as well, so that's yeah. lovely. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I'm going to introduce you, uh, of course, Shahad Ashamari, uh, a well-known Palestinian author and academic. After gaining your PhD at the University of Exeter, Had became an assistant professor of literature in Kuwait. Research interests focus on women mental in literature. Um, I, I, I should, I'm not going to call you that. I'm going to call you by your yeah. first. Yeah. <laughs> interested in the concept of hybridity, um, having been a Bedouin father and a Palestinian mother. She's also interested in disability studies and the correlation of disability studies with identity world have multiple sclerosis at the in 2019 on the British Council's alumni for social impact is of course the author of head of moving memoir of illness um so Shad you know like I guess I I'd heard of course I'd heard of it um, about these things but I didn't know much I didn't really know much about the day that it has on, on the diagnosed as such. So it was really insightful, not in terms of getting to think about disability more broadly as well. Um, what's your first foray into writing, is it? So you've written fiction as well. Um, yeah, poetry and fiction. And this, this was kind of the bridge uh, to get to Head Above Water. Uh, but first of all, thank you, Sophia, for having me here. It's really exciting. I, I love your Instagram account. A lot of readers follow it. And, you know, I love everything you post. So I'm really kind of excited to be, you know, connecting not just with you, but with all these awesome people who are joining us. Um, I'm glad that, you know, the book has sort of started the conversation. Um, and I think, you know, I'm still receiving such nice comments and also a lot of just like you said, you know, I had heard about MS. I just never really thought about it. I had, you know, mm. I have some sort of invisible disability. I've never really thought about it. But when I read the book, I was able to to sort of think about things differently. And I think that was the main kind of, um, not necessarily goal, but one of the goals that, you know, I was kind of, you know, hoping that it would land in the right arms or and that's exactly what happened mm. so yeah i think i think that's that was really the point of, of the book mm. so for people who haven't read head above water i mean you've given us a, a, a i suppose a intro there of, tell us a little bit more about like, above covers 
So Head Above Water uh, Reflections on Illness is a narrative uh, that deals with my experience of living with somewhat of an invisible disability, MS, multiple sclerosis. A lot of people know what MS is, but a lot of people don't. So MS, simply put, is a neurological uh, disease that affects mostly young adults, you know, ages of 18, 19, 20, and it goes up to 30s and 40s. It's uh, universal, um, has no known cause. It is not necessarily genetic. Scientists are still trying to figure out what and how and why. Um, interestingly enough, there isn't much representation of uh, invisible disability in literature or in media. Um, Hollywood still, you know, looks at basically cancer as the number one uh, illness to kind of showcase uh, in, in movies and in literature. So having um, been diagnosed with MS at a very, very young age, about 18, um, still a student uh, about to embark on an undergraduate uh, journey, um, I realized that I had something not just that could have changed my life, maybe not necessarily uh, to the better, but maybe could have completely you know, collapsed my life. I realized that there was a narrative to tell. And so years later, um, I wrote Head Above Water, kind of reflecting on, on this journey that I was hoping would kind of let other people think about not just illness, but also the obstacles in our life. And, you know, how do we keep our heads above water, so to speak? You know, it's, it's easier said than done. And just how we actually manage to kind of just keep swimming, keep surviving, not necessarily reaching the shore, not necessarily, you know, succeeding, but, you know, still just managing to kind of stay alive. And mm -hmm. that's the question that Head Above Water really tries to kind of um, challenge us to, to answer, to ponder, how do we survive? How do we stay alive? Uh, mm -hmm. Easier said than done. And, you know, having, ha not just having MS, but having met so many people with depression, with anxieties, with, you know, visible disabilities, uh, with loved ones with, with disability and, and having noticed this silence around mm -hmm. the body and ar around mental illness and about basically anything that makes us very much human and vulnerable, um, mm -hmm. I realized that I had a story to tell, not just for me, but also to kind of inspire other people to write their own narratives or even, you know, to, to go to your best friend and say, hey, I didn't realize you were you know, struggling that much and I'd like to be a better, you know, ally or I'd like to be a better friend. Mm. So I think that that's Head Up of Water in, in a nutshell. Um, it is a very personal narrative, but, you know, a lot of people uh, are sort of marketing it in a way that, you know, this is just Shahed's story, but I really feel like it's about a lot of people uh, who are in the book, but a lot of people who would also be reading the book are part of that story. Mm. And yeah, yeah. So that's interesting that you mentioned the marketing and how people are, are trying, I suppose, to pigeonhole the book. Absolutely. Try, try and um, categorize it in a way. And on that similar kind of note, it's, uh, I, I know, obviously, because I have this insight, the journey to getting it published, but it's written, the actual journey to getting it published. Also, interesting, I think it, it really feels a lot of the fraught conversation around any of the identity um, things that you present that some people are not willing to face for yet. So could you talk to me about that? I think it's important it should be open. So I think for most Muslim authors, especially women, um, especially women authors and Muslim authors in general, um, there's this tendency to think, you know, if you're if you're Arab, if you're Muslim, if you're, you know, writing in a language that is not your own, then there's a sort of expectation that you know publishers like to see and uh, to a larger extent i don't think just publishers i think the industry in general likes to see uh you representing what it's like to be muslim what's it like to be arab what's it like to be a woman what's it like to be living in a patriarchal society all these kind of um, stereotypes that they'd love to see in the actual literature so when i wrote about illness and i wrote about you know a a very much a personal narrative that didn't touch on what it's like to be Muslim, what's it like to uh, be living uh, in Kuwait, what's it like to be mm -hmm. um, in dealing with you know patriarchy. That was a question mark for a lot of publishers. They wanted mm -hmm. sort of to guide the narrative to talk about Arab women sexuality, you know, what goes on behind closed doors, uh, what's it like, you know, 
uh, not wearing the hijab and so on. These were the things that were you know, sparking interest. The disability story or the illness story was not the priority. That wasn't mm-hmm. the thing that was probably going to sell. And mm-hmm. um, I, I mean, it's sad to say, but you know, I, I sort of submitted the, the manuscript to publishers in North America and Europe all over. And it was interesting that I was getting the same response. Um, some were kind enough to say, you know, while we think this is important, we'd like to know more about what's it like to be living as a woman, as a, as a Muslim in a Muslim country. What, that, what is that like? And how come you're, you're still living in Kuwait? How come you haven't you know, left? So there, there were these questions mm-hmm. that, you know, if you would add a chapter that says that, you, you know, you'll eventually get out. So there was all these sort of... Oh. Yeah. Narratives that you know that they were not how I wanted to represent the story, right. yeah. because it wasn't my reality. But that was the reality that was you know hopefully going to sell. Mm. So it was a very hard journey to actually get the book uh, to be taken seriously, to to be picked up um, for what what it what it was. Um, mm-hmm. Some people thought you know disability is too um, specific of a topic. A lot of people cannot relate. Um, this is not something that, you know, readers who are non-disabled would want to read. Mm. So it would just make me think, you know, then who's the audience? Who's the intended audience? Who are the people who are publishing? Uh, it has a lot of power politics. And the publishing industry was something that really disappointed me mm. until I, you know, um, got to, to Neem Tree Press. And um, that's, that's when the book was uh, picked up. Mm. Uh, and as, of course, you know, Neem Tree Press is all about, you know, making sure that these voices that the publishing industry might have marginalized actually get amplified. Mm. And I think that's what kind of not just, you know, changed my course of, of um, uh, authorship or my life as an author, but kind of gave me hope that there are still, you know, publishers and readers that would like to see more authentic stories rather than just the question of what sells or what are we after, really. It's such a well, the idea of what sells, it took you what's the main market, how one defines the market speaks to the idea of, you know, you and I have talked about this before in the past, like universal universities and, you know, how that's just a for, you know, sort of racist tropes, which you've talked about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I think the the mainstream um, view of in Muslim women, um, women cities, or there's no space for these stories. But I think that is such success with the book is an evidence of the contrary, right? That there are people who are so deeply moved and interested and in learning from the book. It's had such a big um, so the book is written a response to your love. Um, so she of, uh, reading is questioning and engaging with those diary uh, is it's just so beautiful reading that you know, this tenderness and frustration with which you respond to her so emotional reserve the current would have had to really dig into memoir it's very different but I think some poetry is also, things are also revealed perhaps less uh, ways. Um, you know, what did you have to do to, 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 to dig into this sort of stuff and, and this courage in this way? So I think, you know, the book has this element of being a heart-to-heart conversation. Mm-hmm. And that was the usage of um, Yasmin as a character. Um, she's, she's also, a, you know, she was my student, but also is a very good friend now. And we did have these conversations. And, you know, as we had these conversations, um, th- there was not just questioning, but also the urging of, you know, I really wish you would share these stories with others, not just with me. And so it started becoming an issue of, okay, there has to be some sort of ethical responsibility of, you know, sharing these stories that are really difficult to share. But again, with this idea that it might, you know, um, influence or affect the way society thinks about women's bodies in general and, you know, illness and pain and get us thinking about, you know, what it really means to be, um, supportive if, if you know if you have a friend who's living with mental illness physical illness how can I be a better friend and a better ally so in a sense I felt like I was being 
um, pushed to write the book. I wasn't very keen on writing the book a few years back, and that's why I was, you know, writing fiction and poetry. It was a very vulnerable um, sort of exposure uh, to, to uh, you know, the whole world, the book that's just, you know, very, very much out there. Mm. And so during that time, I had to constantly um, sort of, um, you know, revert back to the idea of why am I doing this again? Is, is this is more than just about me? Is this something that's going to um, influence others? You know, should I just keep it in my diary? Those were questions that were constantly uh, there. But, you know, as, as a feminist and as an educator, I really do believe in the power of storytelling. And I, and I believe that, you know, women are really most, you know, throughout centuries have been silenced, not just in personal lives and literature and media, we don't get to kind of have a heart to heart um, with uh, with women and actually listen to them uh, narrating their, their very vulnerable stories. Um, also as an academic and as a professor, I have a lot of students who are here right now, um, they're, in, they're in the Insta Live. And you know, they have this image of me as you know, somebody who has it all together, has it figured out, has, has had no issues you know, growing up, no issues. Uh, with pain, have it easy. And I really thought that, you know, that vulnerability was sort of like a gift I was hoping to share. And, you know, I was hoping that they would learn to kind of give back that same gift, you know, with their friends, with their families, and even to themselves, you know, this idea of I'm fine being vulnerable, and, you know, I'm fine having multiple selves, uh, multiple identities. And, you know, it, it doesn't make me, so to speak, um, you know, weak or a failure. Uh, you know, many times women are told that you have to be completely put together, completely strong, mm -hmm. taken seriously. And I just kind of wanted to sort of attempt to rectify that narrative, at least, you know, with my own vulnerabilities and, and sharing those vulnerabilities. Not, not an easy thing to do at all. So um, I had to make sure that I was, you know, constantly checking in with myself. I had a support group uh, of friends that I was checking in with. Um, I had a therapist who was kind of helping me, you know, work through writing and healing, uh, turn to spirituality. So there's a lot of things that come into uh, being able to kind of uh, write in, in that way. And I think that's important to say, it's not just a brave act, but it needs a lot of resources too. Definitely. I can feel the sense of how deep you've had to go sort of in, in, in your own interiority as well, sort of yourself have grappled with things that you stood up that, you know, you think about vulnerability, showing vulnerability, it's an act of, it is an act of courage, you know, vulnerability um, sort of in our imagination, sort of public is so inspired with weakness. It's like, you know, we don't necessarily think of vulnerability as a point of strength. People come to vulnerabilities because they don't want to be exposed. But I think actually in, in, in exposing that, such an act of feminist resistance to this patriarchal we live in that tells us you know, yourself up from the bootstraps and have a stupid, you know, don't that are upsetting you or why are we keep you up at night you know or the, yeah you're just like man up is it that, that's the expression yeah it even just that expression is but you're right the people that you're in dialogue with about the book and the convention and um how was it for your family and friends to write the memoir like, um, um, in many ways too How's the reaction been just amongst friends and family? I think for a lot of people, also like close people, they were very surprised that, you know, an invisible disability could actually be taking up that much space. Mm -hmm. Again, something that they do not see. So I've had a lot of um, comments, even from people who are very close to me, saying things like, you know, I really had no idea. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel like an idiot. I had no idea. If I had a lot of these, you know, very, very... Um, uh, honest reactions of whoa that that's not something I had thought about I'm sorry I didn't know um, and then there was a sense of I I feel like I need to know more which which really kind of helped me access you know things that I hadn't previously 
uh, felt comfortable enough uh, sharing on a one-to-one -one basis. I think it brought me closer to, to a lot of people. Uh, as you said, friends and family. Um, anytime you're writing something that's narrative nonfiction, there's always the kind of uh, risk of misrepresenting people, um, hurting people by the way you represented them. So I was very careful with that. There are some you know, composite characters in, in the book, a blend of more than one character. So I, I was aware of that as I was writing, but when the book was uh, being read or being received, so far I think it's, it's been very, very positive. Mm. And um, I think everybody's happy with it, but I think there is an element of surprise for sure. Um, people who thought the book would be just about illness are also saying, you know, it's about literature, it's about my yeah. love for poetry, my love for literature. And which brings us back to the idea that, you know, illness is not a topic that is specific. And, you know, there's a lot more than, than just, you know, it being about illness. Mm, yeah, it's not the sum of who you are, even if you every day in a myriad of Absolutely. Um, so this beautiful interview that you did with um, Or, who does yeah. the MS podcast, beautiful conversation that was. It was really lovely the two of you and there's something that you said in that conversation you described ms uh, uh or your diagnosis rather as open to you as the can you tell us in what ways ms was open door but what, what did it up to you so i think when we're young in general um i don't i'm not really sure how to define young but i think most of us feel like we're pretty much invincible and very very much um you know sort of immune to, to, to illness, to disability. Um, we tend to shy away from, um, you know, people who actually are living with disabilities, mental or physical, we kind of have our own little bubble. And so when I was diagnosed at a very early age, it really opened me up to dealing with all sorts of people, uh, people who are older than me, uh, when I kind of had no sense of dealing with it older people that was not something that you know were just, those were not the people I would hang out with mm -hmm. and so when I when I got when I got sick I started dealing with people who were older you know struggling with different disabilities different illnesses um, I started um, having friendships with men and women who were also struggling with different illnesses so it really opened me up to sort of um, I think being a more humble human and this modesty that I don't think I would have had um, if I hadn't actually developed MS. And I, I've also become, a, I think, a much more, um, not just humble, but very grateful person. I have the sense of gratitude every day. It's, it's really connected me to, to what it means to kind of have this privilege of being alive. Mm -hmm. um, and again, of course, it, it, it was something that, that was a journey. I didn't just wake up and say, yeah, I'm really happy I have MS. It's made me a great person. But I think that uh, with kind of being able to understand my body, my emotions, being able to understand what it means to navigate the world with pain, with depression, with anxieties, things that I hadn't thought about earlier. And I think that made me connect with a lot of people um, as, as someone who is very much connected to storytelling. It's made me a better listener. I've listened to a lot of people's journeys um, and a lot of people's own perception of how they tell their story of pain. I don't think I would have been as interested in, in you know, how we navigate the world with our bodies if I hadn't kind of been forced to look at the body and to kind of you know focus on on what what the what bodies mean in general it's something we tend to focus on the mind especially i think in in you know intellectual societies like academia there's a lot of focus on you know your mind your mind but not much on the somatic experience of being alive you know uh it's made me focus on 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 what it means to actually be breathing it, it's turned me to spirituality to breath work things that i i would I don't think i would have actually explored if if ms was not in the picture mm. and yet i want to really watching who hasn't it's not like a positive spin on everything you're at 18 you get diagnosed and you're like oh hallelujah you know it's <laughs> like, Raw. It's very, you know, very um, upfront with, with, you know, what you're having to tackle and what you're having to come to terms with at a young age when you're 
on the cusp of adulthood, on the cusp of independence, the cusp, you know, sort of your life, you know, and then you can like, you know, you, you do plot. It is, a, it is a winding that you go through, and but then it's that rising again. But yeah, just this. I mean, actually, it feeds nicely into my name because uh, you coined. I know you've used it in in uh, academic papers that you've written, but in the book you you talk about it too, and it's random. And you describe it really. If I read what you wrote, what I had meant was that I should expect to randomly lose parts of me and my senses. It didn't feel like a because there were many days where I felt healthy, wouldn't have ever get. But this isn't just about disability. What really matters actually think of love and not in a cliche direct way it is, there's a lot to think about eyes and wonder if your fingers food if you can actually brush it morning or need to come up with a different way to do the same task there's a lot at stake I, it's easy to accept life is random that every day is not simply a day, day alone I can't see like one moment leads to another. One moment you're disabled, the next you're fine. I mean, I think this is a side, you know, particularly of invisible disabilities that just isn't fully appreciated. I suppose it also to the, the experience we had with friends and family. Oh, my God, I feel like such an idiot. <laughs> you know. And, um, yeah. More about this term, random disability, and what it is. Want people to understand a bit. So I think with with disability, what I found that there were a lot of different terms um, that I couldn't actually relate to. And mm. um, when I coined the term "random disability," I, I coined it yes for an academic paper, but I was also really thinking about this randomness of life in general. And I think that um, living with something that's invisible, whether MS or, or other um, invisible disabilities. Sometimes you have symptoms that flare up and sometimes you don't. Sometimes um, I'll go play around the squash, I'll, I'll kick a ball around, and sometimes you know, I can't get out of bed. They're very different two kind of states of being that are extremely uh, different. So random just kind of meant occupying this third space or the space that's um, in between. And I felt that that was really comfortable for me because it was kind of helping me accept that it didn't have to be all black or white and there was this gray area. Mm. Um, also, of course, speaking both English and Arabic, um, it being a hybrid, there was a lot of this randomness I feel in my personal choices in my life. So I felt that random disability kind of fits very nicely with that. Mm. And it was just another tool to kind of help me understand life. Again, it was all about you know, how do you keep your head above water? How do you survive? And there, there was this idea of, well, if we kind of accept the randomness. And I think a lot of people, when, when the pandemic hit, started really thinking about how random COVID was and how randomly, you know, our lives were completely shifted into just, you know, lockdown. And then we were off restrictions and then with restrictions, masked, unmasked. It was, it was pretty random. And, you know, you could get COVID, but then your, your mom and your dad don't. And it just, it was a lot of um, randomness. And mm. I was fine with that because I had kind of already been accustomed to it with, with um, you know, with MS. But I found my friends and people around me who were non-disabled were really struggling with that randomness. Um, mm. So a lot of people struggled with um, accepting you know, what the pandemic was all about and suddenly realizing that we're actually quite vulnerable creatures and mm -hmm. there is a randomness to it. You could be super healthy, your lungs are brilliantly healthy, but then you get long COVID. And oh. so yeah, kind of accepting that a randomness is, is not an easy task, but um, th that was the, the point of kind of coining random disability. I find that it helps just kind of with navigating um, the randomness of life. Mm. And I suppose in many ways it connects people who are considered um, who are non, not non-disabled. Um, it, it gives them a way to connect to that in some way, shape, or form. Because um, I remember a conversation you and I had uh, about how 
problematic um, ways in which we talk about disability really is actually that the onus of fully and functioning seamlessly in the world is is put on those who have a disability rather than on society accommodating um, needs you know so like the transport that we use the architecture landscapes and the ability to the out or even the classroom we think of all the various spaces that are around us such a world largely inaccessible at best and really actually hostile at worst right um yeah. it means that people are just not able to to enter into certain um and yet it's interesting because being healthy and being able-bodied is actually a, is a temporary state for most of us right like everybody at some point is going to experience illness or injury old age or a number of things that will mean they are limited by their ability um so you write right we will become one day part of the cycle of life like choose to avoid it will part of us that is the hardest part my younger self felt to be a betrayal of the body i was young today i accept it part of who I am. The way I measure my life, moment, peak, energy, and continuous love while I carry another. Rumi said the wound is where life Also my mother said that a real reference. That's the academic <laughs> But it was my mother who passed his words along to me. If the wounds are where the life they are all wound features and if all the light together able to see I and I want you to see. so here are the wounds as they relate to a language pieced together a sense of everything we feel but don't and can't label and this is a place of exploration a place of loss and pain. guys this is beautiful <laughs> we have to be going I mean there's just so much to Sort of really, um, and really like sort of you know dive into just in this one little bit. But what I really found was this idea of you know, disability will arrive at everybody's door, or, or limitations on our you know exist in this world will come in at some point for everyone. Uh, and, and you mentioned uh, COVID, and I mean, I, on the one hand, it felt like it flipped the world this way around. Now it feels like it's flipped the other way around where you know, COVID still exists, but we're going on like a dozen. It's still yeah. very serious and dangerous for those who are, are vulnerable to it, and yet most people are not wearing masks anymore, at least where I am. You know, it's just wild how quick we start things and move on, right? And and just pretend like it's never going to happen to us. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you'd you'd want to come in on any further than that. Um, I, <laughs> I think that that was, um, uh, you know, just kind of looking back at, at uh, this idea of, you know, all of us are bound to become ill. This is not something that happens to just, you know, a s small population or insignificant population. It's, it's probably old age. It's probably, uh, like I said, you get COVID and now there's a lot of people who are struggling with long COVID. Uh, mm. with chronic fatigue, things that, you know, terms that I hadn't seen um, much of before. Now I see them, you know, being thrown around by by everyone. Uh, chronic fatigue is now a thing because long COVID is now a thing. So I think this idea of us being exposed to illness is, is something that's just part of the human kind of um, cycle or the human narrative in general. And I think I said this one day, and I'm going to repeat it because it really does hold. You, you don't wake up one day, you know, in a completely different gendered body, but you do wake up one day with a disability or with illness. So that's something that you are likely to experience or your significant other or your child or whoever it is, if not you. So that's something I think that should kind of make us want to be better allies. Uh, it, it's something that we are are bound to experience so it would be kind of 
part of our journey to be better humans, to be better allies. So whether you're a man, you're a woman, what your politics are, that doesn't really matter. It's, it's basically about being a better ally and a better human. And again, it's eventually is something that you will have to step into, a, you know, a place that you will probably end up in. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Head Above Water is trying to do. I talk about allyship in the book and education, um, mm -hmm. you know, how to make things more accessible, um, how, you know, we, we can have more audiobooks, uh, how university could be more accessible to a lot of, a lot of students with disabilities. Um, there's a lot of, you know, um, sort of stigma still around saying, you know, I have anxiety during an exam or, you know, I struggle with depression. I'm unable to meet my deadlines. So there's still accommodations that are not put into place and that can be put into place. But mm -hmm. again, we, we don't have those allies yet. And the people in power are still not really doing the best the job that they can. Mm -hmm. And it's so important, isn't it? Because I mean, it's saying to me once that you know, people are not the allies that they think that they are. And, you know, to be a sympathetic is not enough. And I've seen in the book that you write about newly after being diagnosed and you go back to university and you're applying for a permit to be able to park university to the campus. And um, the guy, you know, in the office, he was a man either off on it and... Uh, Looking at you and you, yeah, you know, fine. Oh, you know, and he's making the R for you, and he's, like, inshallah, you'll be okay. And you're, yeah, yeah. and then, you know, <laughs> months, months, go through the ordeal of every six months coming back. Yeah, still got it. You know, it's just, I mean, he's trying to be sympathetic and, you know, sizing, but it just goes to show that it's not enough. Yeah, nice kind, I suppose. Word um, really be the word. Absolutely, and, and there are bigger power structures to it, and there are bigger, you know, people who are in charge. It, it, it's a whole system, I think. It's very systemic, and it does yeah. come out to be very much like systemic violence. Really, uh, this everyday uh, ableism is very much connected to to this lack of awareness, this almost carelessness, even if there is an awareness, and it's not going to happen to me, which again goes back to this idea of, of being better allies. Mm, yeah. So you write many inter intersections, you know, as an Arab woman, as a Muslim, as a disability, as a Palestinian, as a Kuwaiti, as an academic, you know, you speak from all these different positionalities. And in chapter three, you speak of the body as from which you are dislocated or even exile in some way. You talk of the body, land that can be invaded, over, claimed, missed, loved, rebelled within. And it feels intimately connected to your Palestinian roots too. Can you tell us about the cross being exiled from one's homeland, but also from one's body? I found that absolutely beautiful. So I think that does come from uh, having Palestinian, um, uh, my mother's side is Palestinian, that's a maternal side. And I had always thought about exile and I had always thought about it as a very political situation. Um, uh, my grandmother used to say, you know, leaving home is the worst thing that can happen to you. It's, it's something that you can never heal from and you always want to go back. And so I think in a sense, I carry that intergenerational fear of you know being exiled this dislocation but when ms came into the picture that's when i started thinking well this is the home that i have this is the closest thing i have to home the body that you're born into before you're able to recognize anyone else this is the body that you recognize as, as your own the second we start recognizing that you know i'm not part of my mother anymore mm -hmm. and you know I'm, I'm, I'm actually a separate entity you look down and this is the body you're born into. This is the body that becomes a sense of home. Mm -hmm. And so when illness or disability enters a picture, you look down and this body doesn't feel like it's yours anymore. And there's mm -hmm. a sense of um, interruption. There's a sense of dislocation. And it made me think about exile. It made me think about how sometimes you're forced uh, out of a home, again, in a political sense, in a geographical sense, but also so many times our bodies will, will expel us. Sometimes the mind will, will you know, say, no, nope, enough. And you know, in the sense of depression or, or mental illness, there's a sense of 
you know, shut down, complete shut down, which also must feel like exile. Mm -hmm. I think I just made that connection just kind of reflecting on uh, conversations again uh, with the maternal, um, with the mater maternal side of the family, with you know older women, older generations who had experienced exile in a very, very traumatic sense. And so mm -hmm. I carried that with me as a term, exile. And I think you know that that was part of just the reflection on the body. Mm, amazing. Thinking now, as you were speaking, you mentioned earlier you were trying to get the book published, and you had those who wanted you to western white gaze more um, where's the chapter about wait <laughs> you know where's the chapter about to leave where's the chapter about you? and i just think again it's that simple question to ask the implications of that question and what it does what it erases in terms of your own personal histories and what your family has <laughs> just you know again it's that need so we're talking about being on disability living is so with you know, various histories as well right and yeah uh, so it's yeah so there was a that i was really fascinated by was your the, the gender you have right so one hand, you, you write about the need to cling on to your womanhood, you know, womanhood as society structure, right? So being slim, being beautiful, being young, being always ready, whilst at the same time finding yourself almost transcending. Uh, you know, there's this moment in the, in the book you a warrior in Arabic, and you know, in Arabic, as you know, uh, as I'm sure lots of people here know, um, where the gendered masculine word and, yeah, uh, uh, men. so it's like you know your your illness has made gender in some way that's also made you more aware of of gender too so you know the body that you embody so you've spoken about the way the world and existing since your diagnosis how you found way expressing your gender or in gender well, I think, I mean, I hadn't thought about it until now when, when, you, when you're asking about this warrior issue. Um, it's interesting. Uh, he did say that, istirahat um, muharib, muharib being warrior. And I hadn't thought it was non-gendered until when you asked this question. Uh, but I find that not just with MS, but also with writing about disability or about writing about this illness, it's connected me to a lot of people um, in ways that I think as a woman, I wouldn't have been able to access these spaces. And it's been interesting being able to kind of, you know, speak to, uh, you know, men who are living with, with MS and their gendered experiences, um, having the space of where disability becomes the, uh, I guess I want to say the category or the tag rather than gender. And it's interesting because people still want these identifiers, you know, they still want these identifiers there. But disability becomes the identifier that kind of um, allows for mutual recognition of, you know, of each other, mutual recognition of the other. And uh, it, it's definitely been that being able to write about the body has kind of connected me with, with different age groups and different genders, all under the same kind of idea of, yeah, that's how I feel, you know, mm -hmm. the individual, whether... Um, whether here or abroad, uh, regardless of gender. So I think it's taking me out of a lot of categories that mm. you know, I didn't expect to happen. But especially now with the reception of the book, I'm seeing that happen and, and it's been really fascinating. Mm, incredible. Um, I have to ask your mother. I know with guys, <laughs> and I just have to ask her. Wonderful mum who clearly you have such a beautiful tender relationship. Well, and I think that's one of the, one of the elements of the book I love too was um, you hardly ever get you know these enriching um, and hard life enhanced female relationships that most women have in their lives, right? Like I mean, relationship is probably the least interest of the relationships that I have, right? Like my friends. Yeah. <laughs> 
life, my mum, like uh, mentors. I mean, there, there's there's so many relationships that in particular sort of engender among that we don't get enough that in literature. So seeing yeah. these relationships that you have coming mean, in your absolutely wonderful and and cared for you instead of us. But she was also willing to sort of dish love for you. Um, <laughs> yeah. Again, you write page three for those who have the book. You write first few years of my episode, Mama ignored the fact. The astrologist told her first and to make peace with us that it wouldn't be a normal young woman. That, sorry, that I wouldn't be a normal. I wouldn't have a. I would need complete care. She looked at him and left without ever outside his office, um, where I where I let me know that nothing I wouldn't be able to do. I, I mean, when I read that, I was just, oh, go, Mama Bear, you know. Um, <laughs> I guess she would like that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> like how much? And I read because I had uh, I have a daughter um, mm. who very early on. There, there was nothing um, that, 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 anyways, in the end, but very within the first few months of her life, first two years of her life, actually. There, oh, we're going to, we're going to do this, and we're going to, you know, consider this. We'll die this for our blood. All the complicated. Um, and I just remember, just like, you do all the investigation you need to do, but I am not limited. My child in any way and now she and she was destined to be absolutely amazing she genuinely is and uh, artistic she's sport she's you know into her science she's just all around amazing yeah. Yeah. a lot of that has to do with uh, the fact that I'm very adamant you know I was not going to um, project onto her the limitations that somebody else was insisting yeah. she was going to have, you know, like but and, and so I wondered how much this is down to mama's belief in you. Also, how often unrealistic, be harmful to you. Because I'm also very much aware it's sort of, for, you know, um, are sort of hell, you know, I don't know. I just, like, it is like able-bodied people like, oh, you're so brave. Oh, you're so, <laughs> and it's so, you know, it's just, you know, it's really like, Icky, right? It, it's very patronizing, and um, you know, out trying to be somebody's inspiration. Um, why, why put it in terms like I mean, okay, we don't say to you know, who's able-bodied, who's got up and done, but you're inspiring. Um, just they did it. Um, so I, I just I was wondering, you know, because there is a balance to this, right? How well do you balance? Well, I mean, I think, to be fair, I think a tough life needs sort of um, a lot of tough love. Mm -hmm. And I think that also comes from Palestinian, um, Palestinian genes more, more, <laughs> more, more than anything. There's this also sense of constant, uh, a constant fight that, that's being put up. There's this constant, um, uh, constant desire to stay alive. There's this constant desire to keep surviving. And I think, again, a tough life kind of needs a tough language too. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where that, that sort of that toughness um, comes from. Um, there, there's no, no alternative to, to that sense of extreme um, fear of loss or that extreme fear of, uh, you know, com completely a life that's not worth living. That's what they were telling her. And I think that's kind of where, yes, Mama Bear comes in. But more than that, there was a sense of how much of tough love can I give? Mm -hmm. And I think, um, again, I'm speaking on her behalf, so I'm sure she would narrate it differently. But, you know, the older version of me says, or my older self says, I can see where that toughness comes from. Because, I mean, if I had been in those shoes I'm not sure how I would have handled it. Um, I don't think I would have been as able to keep it together, but her keeping it together was probably the reason I managed to keep it together. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, being a good ally, I think starts off with also recognizing that 
this person still has potential. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, uh, especially with illness, there's a sense of, you know, you've lost all capabilities, a sense of you're, you're, you're a child, you're an infant, who will not be able to take care of yourself. And then that narrative gets kind of pushed down your throat. Mm. So I think the other side of it, and that was, I think, the, the part that she went for, which was, there's nothing that you can't do. And while I understand the, the politics behind it, of it also being you know, kind of problematic when, when we talk about disability, I think in this case, um, it worked for the meanwhile. And then I had to step in and start thinking about, okay, now that we kind of kept it together for so long, what about vulnerability? What about actually being able to talk about that which we did not speak about? Mm. And I think that's where my own kind of politics comes in which is, again, uh, kind of informed by this intergenerational, um, you know, trauma of exile, but also feminism, um, also, you know, this, this idea of what does it mean to be a feminist today? There's all, all of these things that, you know, she probably hadn't thought of, but I was kind of able to add to the mix. And I think that's where the balance comes from for me, being mm. able to be, you know, able to say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a disability studies scholar living with disability. I believe in the lived experience of pain. That doesn't mean this is um, a shameful experience or a weak one, so to speak. So I think that's where the balance comes in, being able to embrace all these different parts. Mm, yeah, that's amazing. So it, it feels like Mama gave you like a solid foundation. I think so, yeah. Uh, foundation. You were then able to go abilities. So let's talk about that now. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, so I, I did promise you I'm very strict on time because I think <laughs> going over time. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Thank you so much for today. But before I do let you go, I'm wondering if there's anything that else that you're working on now, if there's currently working on, um, look for um, not at the moment. I am thinking of a fiction book, though, so also dealing with disability. So we'll see if that kind of, uh, you know, takes off or not. Uh, but, in, you know, for now, I'm kind of just really, you know, enjoying connecting to all these different people, to all these readers that, you know, otherwise I wouldn't have connected with, if not for Neem Tree Press and, and you know, yourself on, on, on Instagram. And there's been just, you know, such amazing, you know, return such an such an amazing reward at the moment so i'm kind of just you know basking in that for a friend right. yeah, so you should so you should it is our current um, uh, no we were speaking, right, but that's been changed now we're going to be next. instead to discuss the i mean the feedback that i've got far from everybody who's reading it is just that oh my god this is all this is very poignant and it's very evocative eye-opening it's inspiring um we've spoken a lot about the, you know we some about you know your heritage and bodies and you know as better land and home you know there's just still so much there's even <laughs> i mean it's not that big a book though right and yet you page is brimming with um thought words strung together so thank you so much Dad. thank you so much I'm out and thank you for joining us. Of course, there will be a recording available for everybody to later as well. Have a lovely. Oh, um, EJ Chaikahani. She said she absolutely loved it as well, which is uh, wonderful to see. A lovely review on her Instagram as well. It was such a kind review. Yeah, I feel like I have to apologize. My children are absolutely quiet in the background, but my children are out and I can't do anything about them. I'm afraid. <laughs> that was if you can hear that I need to go outside and like kids. All right. You have a lovely evening, Shahad. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. It was great. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. That was a pleasure. Thank Love you. It.